Good afternoon. Welcome to the NHGRI seminar series on both predictions for human genomics by 2030. Uh, you can find more information about this seminar series at this website, genome.gov slash bold predictions. Okay, let me see how I move forward. Here we go. Uh, so last year, uh, we published a 2020 strategic vision. Um, um, you know, this uh, um, document was um, designed, I mean, was uh, completed after extensive um, consultation and discussion with many people in the field, including the two speakers today. And um, overall, the vision is for improving human health at the forefront of genomics. This is now supposed to be encompassing the entire uh, human genetics and genomics field, but mostly focusing on what NHGRI will be doing. As you know, predicting future is risky. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the impressive genomic achievements in the history, uh, when viewed in retrospect, could hardly have been imagined 10 years earlier. But still, it's fun to, to make predictions. And so in this document, we had 10 bold predictions for what human genomics will be uh, in 2030. Um, most of this probably will not be fully attained, but this is supposed to be an inspirational, an aspirational document to um, you know, inspire people to strive for something that's not possible today, and also provoke discussions on what might be possible in the forefront of genomics. Um, so to kind of uh, unpack or expand those one sentence or predictions, and not also start discussions, um, a seminar series was designed mostly in credit of Chris Gunter, who, who is here with us. And uh, so it started in February. Um, so today is the third installment of this seminar series. This will run through June 10th, 2022. And again, you can find all the information about these seminars on the website. The format for each seminar are two peer, you know, two speakers each gave 25 mini talks, followed by moderated discussions and then question answers from the audience. By the way, please feel free to um, uh, submit your questions through the question and answer button. Please don't use the chat button. And um, uh, these uh, questions will be answered um, at the end of the talk, but you don't have to wait until the end. So again, today's talk is regarding the third bold prediction, the general features of the epigenetic landscape and transcriptional output will be routinely incorporated into the predictive models of the effect of genotype on phenotype. And we have two fantastic speakers, uh, Tom uh, Gingeris and Tuli Lapalinen. Dr. Gingeris is professor, head of functional genomics and cancer center member uh, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. He received his PhD from New York University, followed by postdoc research and staff scientist appointment at Cold Spring Harbor. He then moved to West Coast, initially uh, with a position in Salt Institute and then went to biotech companies before returning to Cold Spring Harbor in 2008 he was the vice president of biological sciences at um, AP Metrics. His current group studies where and how functional information is stored and regulated in the genomes. And these efforts help explain the biological and clinical effects of uh, disease causing gene mutations in humans and other organisms. He has been the leader in um, an encode, mouse encode, mod encode projects of NIH. Dr. Lapalainen is an associate professor at University, uh, Columbia University and also a core faculty member at the New York Genome Center uh, since 2014. She received her PhD from the University of Helsinki, uh, Finland, um, followed by postdoc research at the University of Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and also Stanford University. She has pioneered the integration of large-scale genome and transcriptome 
sequencing data to understand how genetic variation affects gene expression, uh, providing insight to cellular mechanisms underlying genetic risk for disease. Her research focuses on functional genetic variation in human populations and its contribution to traits and diseases. Uh, Dr. Lebelinian has made important contributions to several international research consortia in human genetics, including 1000 Genome Project and GTEx project. As, in, uh, in, as a matter of fact, next month, Dr. Lebelinian will begin, begin a new role as a director of um, SciLab Labs, National Genomics Infrastructure, as well as a full professor in genomics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So I believe Tom will be the first speaker. Um, Tom, um, the podium is yours. Let me um, stop sharing here and you can start your slides. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to take part in this program of bold uh, pr predictions. I'd like to say at the outset that uh, there's a relatively high bar been set by the previous four speakers, and, uh, and I hope to be able to match that. Anyway, so let's begin. The, um, the, the bold prediction number three, as read by Paul, basically states that the general features of the epigenetic landscape and transcriptional output will routinely be incorporated into the predictive models uh, uh, as they impact genotype on phenotype. This is, uh, as you look at this, uh, the details of this prediction, it's clear that it's bold, but it's also clear that it's somewhat daunting. Specifically, it's composed of three independent uh, components, each of which have several areas of challenge. And it's the it is my intention and uh, goal for this presentation to focus on these challenges as a means to move beyond this particular uh, bold prediction into others. The first of these areas uh, which there, it, this prediction is composed of is the collection analysis of uh, personal genomes. And by that I mean uh, the generation of phased biallelic genome sequences. It also consists of a collection of relevant transcriptional and epigenetic profiles, ideally using long read sequences analysis and to uh, gather both sequence and, uh, sequence and modification data at the same time. The second feature, the second interdependent component is the use of predictive modeling uh, that approaches uh, uh, this, this data set, uh, uh, integrates it and begins to look for relationships with known pathways such that the outcome is a proposed phenotype. And the third uh, component of this uh, uh, long, uh, of this bold prediction is, um, as mentioned by a variety of our other previous speakers, is that the phenotypes that they are going to be detected or predicted will in fact uh, occur at many, many biological levels, which we'll discuss in, in a few minutes. But what exactly, what exactly do we want the, uh, uh, the outcome of this bold prediction to look like? What is the goal of this, uh, uh, this prediction in a, in a sort of substantive way? And that goal is in the ideal situation, samples from a symptomatic or asymptomatic individual uh, is obtained and is uh, and can be obtained either from an anatomical source, namely one of the organs, or a, a source that's easily accept, uh, accessible, which will then serve as a surrogate for the affected uh, uh, organ or tissue. This sample will be used uh, will be used to uh, gather the genome sequencing of the provider and provide also information in terms of the transcriptional profiles and epigenomic profiles. These data will then be analyzed using computational algorithms uh, to determine how the sum total of these data point to one or more genomic variants as the cause of the anomalous transcriptional or epigenetic phenotypes that may be contributing 
to the complex phenotype. The, the, um, the, the, this this uh, set of goals really has several unresolved and unappreciated challenges for both precision medicine and precision genomics. And it, it, they will also lead, I think, to additional kinds of opportunities for bold predictions. The, the unresolved and challenges and the unresolved and unappreciated challenges uh, concern collecting um, uh, uh, collecting transcription and epigenetic data by, ma by many consortia. These consortia have had a long-term interest in collecting basic uh, data as to the uh, functional areas of the genome and how they're regulated. The, they include uh, ENCODE, GTEx, ROADMAP, uh, and uh, NTEx. The, the, con the consortia efforts uh, are also, uh, these consortia efforts also have been in the business of looking for genetic um, uh, causative mutations. Now, the union of these two kinds of efforts is currently under uh, undergoing, and it's it, this is uh, the uh, this bold prediction really serves as a way in which to uh, bring together these these two uh, very uh, important efforts. Now. In light of these efforts, um, and in light of these goal, uh, these resources that have been collected over the years, uh, and the goal laid out by the prediction number three, um, many challenges have emerged that need to be addressed if this prediction is to be actually realized. And uh, what I'd like to go over is a brief summary of the challenges that have emerged uh, 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 upon thinking about what is ent entailed in this bold prediction. First of all, the identification of generic variants giving rise, giving rise to um, um, phenotypic results uh, as measured by changes in the level of expression and epigenetic uh, modifications uh, is a real challenge and has been a challenge for a very long time. Uh, the, um, the, the second challenge is that, that there are, the fact is that many genes have multiple functionality and, and they also have multiple isoforms, some of which are, are responsible for the different functionalities of that gene. The third uh, challenge is that this, there is an inc the increased availability of having normal tissue, don't, uh, uh, normal tissue available for analysis and study. This includes the brain, heart, kidney, things that which are not easily accessible in the normal individual in order to study a baseline of profiles that will in fact constitute what is normal. Uh, the definition, of the, the sheer definition of what is normal is actually also important because at that, it is that uh, state, uh, which is likely to be a range uh, of uh, states, it is that state which we're going to consider how to evaluate the data that we'll collect both from the, uh, genomic and epigenomic states. The, uh, for the fifth uh, variable uh, point uh, challenge is the differences in the transcription and epigenetic profiles that exist in samples that have been analyzed from living and post-mortem samples. There is a considerable amount of data, particularly when it, uh, it entails analysis of difficult uh, accessible tissue that come from post-mortem studies. And it's this challenge I'd like also to talk about. And finally, the environmental influences on somatic uh, epigenetic changes and the, uh, and the pathways that lead uh, to those changes uh, uh, co as caused by the environment uh, uh, is, quite, is quite important. And, and while it has been a subject of considerable interest for a long time, the, uh, the processes involved in this is still quite unknown. The, Let's, so let's walk through these challenges that I just enumerated uh, briefly and talk a little bit about uh, each one in, in order to get some clarity as to what, the, uh, what is meant. The first, uh, the first of these um, uh, challenges was basically the identification of the variants that give rise uh, to finish. Uh,
uh, phenotypic variation. And the depiction on the slide here is of two genic regions uh, uh, where mutations have been identified and they, uh, they have been identified as uh, present in, um, in, in the gene and also identified as a site where uh, epigenetic modifications are important in the expression of that gene. This is important because in the, um, uh, in the two genes that we have here, there are two points I'd like to highlight. First, the phenotypic effect of genomic variation is dependent upon knowing where to look beyond RNA expression and epigenetic uh, modifications. And where, in what biological level is this, uh, is this phenotype likely to be exhibited? And if that's not known, then in fact, the variation that we see is dependent on making predictions alone rather than actually having physical uh, results to fall back on. The second point that this, so this slide is intended to uh, identify is that, that complex uh, phenotypes are often um, uh, caused by multiple uh, genotypic changes. And although there's only, in these examples, only one site cited, most of the uh, challenge that's going to be uh, uh, facing the, the, future, uh, um, the, the future accomplishment of this uh, old, old prediction is to be able to identify all related ch uh, uh, changes that in fact contribute to the uh, phenotype of, of uh, interest. The second challenge is basically the issue of multifunctional role of genes as, as uh, uh, is complicated. And it is, uh, uh, it is the uh, determinative faction, uh, factor that, these, that some of these multifunctional uh, elements are uh, affected while others are not. One feature of this challenge is that there's a pression, uh, a, the presence of expression levels in for, of different isoforms and, and different cell types. So the same gene can have obviously different isoforms, but those isoforms can in fact vary in their expression level depending on what cell type is investigated. <coughs> the most, most novel isoforms are expressed at fairly very low levels. Uh, they're somewhere between uh, 10 to 1,000 fold less uh, 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 lower than what the major isoform is. But, but the fact of the matter is that roughly 43% of, of the express, 43% uh, uh, of, of um, genes that have multiple expressed isoforms, in fact, uh, have uh, these lower expressing isoforms as the major expressed uh, isoform in many other cell types. So it, it, it makes it somewhat arbitrary to say that there is a predominant isoform because it's very much tissue dis, uh, dependent. And it may be that it's, uh, those isoforms lead to other uh, uh, different um, uh, phenotypes. <clears throat> the, I wanted to now uh, uh, address the issue of what is normal. Because the uh, several of the features that we'll discuss, challenges we'll discuss later, will depend upon getting a sense of what is operable, what is normal in in uh, e each uh, cell type or each organ that we're in uh, investigating. Phenotypes can occur in any of these biological levels, from the uh, level of the protein being made up to the level of subpopulations where environmental influences uh, uh, have uh, effects on the overall expression levels and the phenotypes that are present. So if the individual phenotypes will be different in, uh, will be different in each of these biological levels, then, <clears throat> then we have a uh, task in, to, in trying to understand which of these levels we're going to use in order to identify the effects of, ma of major mutations. <clears throat> Finally, the, you, you can determine the range of expression and the loci of epigenetic modifications in genes of interest uh, uh, as part of this baseline, as part of this normalcy. And that's going to be important because in many of these instances, it will be alterations in the levels of expression and the position and presence of modifications. <clears throat> there, there is 
the idea of normalcy comes into play uh, when uh, when asking uh, oneself, where are you going to find normal samples? It, it is true that in uh, the, the NIH and many other funded agencies, funding agencies have made uh, great progress in providing samples for a variety of different study uh, types of studies. But the fact of the matter is that many of these studies uh, and, and sample collections uh, deal primarily with specific disease states. And the idea for normal controls in for these disease states is uh, at, at least only part of the, the uh, collections that are being uh, brought together. In addition uh, 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 of this, there are many uh, centers, many surgical centers in the United States. Most, uh, most fairly large hospitals have such uh, surgical centers. And the, these surgical centers uh, are routinely operating by, uh, and on individuals in which uh, normal tissue is part of the uh, 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 resections are part of the normal uh, uh, procedure. But those, those normal tissues are removed and, and usually just discarded. Uh, and this, this leaves us a, uh, a, a resource that is really untapped. And one thought is that many surgical centers uh, could, with in, incentive, being incentivized by NIH, uh, basically look to uh, uh, keep these normal tissues and make them available uh, either to a central resource uh, depository or to make the, uh, uh, these resources uh, uh, locally available to those who request it. The, the bottom line is that that these are valuable resources to provide a baseline understanding of what uh, diff what each gene and what each regulatory element in those uh, in that genome is uh, how it's operating, and so the, you could think of this as sort of leaving no tissue behind. In the um, in the next to last uh, challenge that we that we're talking about today is the differences that trans at the transcriptional and epigenetic profile obtained from living and postmortem uh, individuals. In a set of studies that we have recently published, uh, what we did was to look at the, uh, the performance or the expression levels of uh, all of the genes uh, of the, the entire genome of several individuals, about two dozen. And in, the, in these two dozen individuals, Half were actually uh, patients undergoing epileptic uh, treatment uh, surgery. And in that surgery, the, the normal tissue is uh, uh, unavoidably removed as part of the uh, treatment. That represented a opportunity to look at gene expression in those tissues and compare it to individuals who had, uh, who had died and uh, and had donated their, their tissues uh, for analysis. And all of these individuals were, were then uh, uh, examined both at the uh, RNA expression level and epigenetic level. And you can see from this slide that the expression levels of, of, these, of these genes look very similar in the top four uh, samples where there's quite uh, fresh samples. Half of these in each of these panels is composed of uh, individuals who uh, were deceased and which are in red and half of which are uh, came from living donors. And in the case of housekeeping genes, which are the first upper uh, panels A to D, those genes are almost identical in both living and uh, deceased individuals. In the case of the postmortem uh, samples, the uh, these there were about 2,000 genes that, in fact, uh, uh, were affected and differed between the two states. Uh, this is also true when you look at uh, the uh, RNA editing at the, uh, the three, three, three and five prime UTRs. There is an appreciable difference in the genes that are not housekeeping genes. These variations that we see, uh, for the most part, are not only uh, uh, loss of expression, uh, 
presumably due to degradation of the RNA, but also by uh, some genes that, in fact, remarkably increase their expression, and uh, and the cells are, are remain quite viable, uh, and uh, and it's these uh, these genes that often are uh, will will uh, somewhat affect the outcome of uh, uh, understanding what the um, what the effects, uh, what the behavior of certain brain uh, uh, sided genes are. So it, it is important, I think, at the end that we understand that the selection of tissues uh, uh, not only be normal, but not come from a, a state which is very challenging to a very large number of genes uh, if they come from postmortem uh, individuals. Finally, the, um, the, uh, the environmental influences on somatic epigenetic changes is a, a well-studied uh, area. And the signals and pathways leading to genomic specificity as to where these modifications occur after exposure to environmental conditions is really uh, an area that's uh, quite challenging. The mechanisms the pathways and agents that are responsible for uh, identifying the locations and the type of modification that goes there is still un uh, uh, understudied and very valuable uh, area of, of study. Th this is a challenge that will in fact require a variety of approaches in order to solve. Now, having gone through these, um, uh, these challenges, I'd like to actually suggest that these offer opportunities to see additional progress come forward. And I'd like to go through that for uh, some of these uh, challenges. For example, the, the, the challenges that we talked about in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of things that could perhaps be approachable by two, 2030 consist of uh, uh, issues like the identification and, it, and engineering of uh, gene uh, iso isoformic regions of genes in a cell type specific manner, uh, uh, and and uh, and uh, these genes being selected by uh, cl being clinically important uh, during development or during a disease state. This this uh, this prediction of what we could do could then provide a, a fundamental understanding of how how different isoforms uh, function and how they actually uh, uh, operate in uh, a, a normal metabolic or in a, a disease state. We, the, another prediction is that in, in light of the need for uh, larger access to uh, tissues that are nominally normal, uh, one could suggest that NIH, the NIH funded tissue collection mandate to uh, mandate to uh, request all participating met medical centers to con contribute normal tissue that are uh, are consent for genome and RNA and epigenetic sequencing, and use these data to better define what normal is. And then the last prediction is that you could uh, the uh, identify genes whose expression profiles of all of all cell types and organs that are affected by. Um, uh, the by postmortem conditions, uh, all the the uh, the use of these data, in fact, should be uh, corrected, and in doing so, what will provide a, a better way in which to understand uh, how how they operate in very specific types of tissues. In the the bolder, more more bold uh, versions of predictions come in the form of two. The identification of all causative genetic variants giving rise to changes in levels of expression and epigenetic marks by identifying populations within the normal expression profiles and that the location in cell types, uh, uh, in the location, that is to say cell types and organs of all expressed coding and non-coding genes. And to do this, the prediction is that uh, one could take advantage of the ongoing and developing work of in vivo sequencing and uh, chip analysis uh, and could provide a level as to where these, uh, uh, where these uh, variations are occurring and where these phenotypes uh, can be seen. And finally, the, the prediction that uh, is, uh, um, involves the 
uh, environmental influences on somatic epigenetic changes could in fact uh, come in the form of identification of cellular signals and pathways leading to the specificity, that is to say, uh, which ones are, uh, uh, which modifications are occurring at which sites, that, uh, that uh, 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 goal could in fact be approachable by the development of uh, markers, that is to say RNAs, proteins, lipids from easily obtainable biological samples uh, rather than uh, uh, samples that would have to require surgical intervention, but use them as surrogates, act as surrogates for markers uh, uh, that you, you would like to study in uh, less attainable organs or tissues. Now these, these, tissue, these uh, uh, predictions and these challenges, I think offer an opportunity to think ahead and to think of ways in which we could uh, uh, move the, the, uh, uh, the, the fields forward if we in fact uh, could uh, achieve some of these uh, uh, predictions. It's important to note that not all of these uh, bold predictions that are at the end of this presentation require novel, uh, novel technology or novel in inventions. Many of them require a decision uh, and a commitment to, uh, in fact, um, uh, provide resources that uh, would be helpful in solving some of the challenges that were uh, discussed. So I, I'd like to end by acknowledging uh, the, uh, my colleagues, uh, both at Cold Spring Harbor and uh, at Harvard and uh, Yale, who have contributed to the data that was uh, used in, and generated in these, in these studies that I mentioned, and, and mostly for the ideas that uh, have often been uh, traded among all, all of us as we think about the data, the massive sets of data that we collected in these different consortia. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering any questions that um, the audience might have. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, we'll hold the um, question and answer session until uh, later. So um, Maybe you can um, stop sharing the screen and truly it's um, the next speaker. All right. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me here as a part of this very exciting uh, seminar series. So um, just to get, get kind of like right, right into this. Uh, when, I, when I saw this, uh, this uh, prediction and when I was asked to, to talk about it, I first started thinking that there is multiple interesting premises that are baked into this, this uh, statement that I'm not going to read right, because it's long, that I wanted to kind of dissect uh, today and, and discuss whether these are true, what, what do we know about these and, and how do we actually make this prediction a reality. So the, the first kind of um, um, sort of something that is implicit in this, in this um, uh, prediction is that it talks about prediction models of the impact of genotype on phenotype, but also suggesting that we will need uh, epigenetic and transcriptional data to make this work. So that's basically implying that genotype data alone will not be sufficient to predict physiological disease uh, phenotypes in, in humans. And, and that's an interesting proposal that, that I'll, I'll inspect a little bit later. And then again, if we are saying that we want to include some other phenotypes, not just genotype and phenotype, that we, we need other layers of, of biological data, then uh, that transcriptome and epigenome data would be those data types that would be informative, uh, useful data types here, uh, implying that they are at the very least correlated with genetic variants and physiological traits, and potentially even uh, mechanistically mediating those genetic effects on, on disease traits. And then uh, the third aspect is that to say that this would be routinely incorporated into these predictive models implies that we would be able, or maybe we are already able, but, but at least in the future that we would be able to measure these molecular phenotypes at sufficiently high scale and precision for these data to be actually useful. So, so I'll be discussing what's, what's the current data supporting these premises, what are some of the other key insights that we have learned, and how do we make this prediction into reality, and what are the other components sort of like around this, this pro-topic that, that need to be 
um, kind of where we need to push as a community to make this this happen. And Tom already touched on on some of these these uh, points, but I hope to expand on on some of the aspects. So when it comes to uh, the prediction of phenotype from genotype, especially in the complex trait um, uh, space, has many fundamental challenges that we are now very well aware of as a, as a field. So of course now um, after uh, whatever 15 years of G uh, GWAS, we know that uh, the heritability of, of complex traits is, is distributed in, in teeny tiny genetic effects across the genome and that these uh, variants actually account for just a fraction of the phenotypic variance in complex traits. Even though, I mean, it's probably, uh, this is an NSGRI uh, seminar series, I'm a geneticist, we love to think about genetic variance, but it is not all uh, that matters in complex traits. And then we also know that these, um, the most of GWAS heritability is in non-coding regions of the genome with likely regulatory functions and, and the and the sort of interpretation of these, these uh, variants has been quite complicated. And in fact, if we would start to think that we would want to have like the perfect in silico interpretation prediction of the functional and phenotypic effects of, of these non-coding variants, uh, uh, that would actually require pretty much perfect knowledge of cellular molecular biology and genome function. And we are very far from this. When we think about that, you would just see a variant and you would say that, okay, this is, it affects the binding of this kind of transcription factor and the enhancer activity in this way and leads to this fall change um, uh, um, effect in the expression of a nearby gene and perturbs this pathway that then changes the cellular function that leads to some physiological function. We are extremely far from this and we're not going to get there in, in 2030 um, uh, alone. So, so that's sort of like just sort of like a black box prediction of just taking genotype and getting to phenotype. I don't think that is going to work. We do need those additional data sets and, and insights that, that I'll, I'll talk about today. And then why do we care about these predictions anyway? Of course, there is the, the sort of the big goal of, of pretty much all biomedical research of, of being able to provide better diagnosis and treatment to, to individuals uh, who suffer from, from uh, some disease. And the traditional medicine paradigm, of course, be, is that you basically have the phenotype data and then you infer, uh, make some inference of what would be the appropriate diagnosis and treatment. The precision medicine uh, paradigm adds phenotype and, uh, sorry, uh, genotype and environmental data to this to, to hopefully provide better uh, diagnosis and treatment. And then something that we, I guess, could call precision molecular medicine or something has also incorporates gene regulatory readouts, either chromatin state or, or RNA sequencing, gene expression, et cetera, to, to have an even better insight into what is, what is going on and what can we do about it. And so what is the status quo here? And does molecular data, this kind of precision molecular medicine framework actually work? So in, in the rare disease space, we are in a situation where the class is kind of half full when it comes to genotype to phenotype predictions. So exomer genome sequencing can now lead to diagnosis in about like half of rare, severe Mendelian disease type of uh, cases. So that's, that's fantastic. Like this is extraordinary success and has absolutely changed the lives and saved lives of, of many, many people. But of course, 50% is, is not 100%. The glass is still half empty uh, for various reasons regarding like detecting some more complex uh, structural variants and then having more kind of more complex genetic architectures, but also identifying variants as disrupting gene function or dosage. Um, not every disease causing variant is sort of like a stop code, premature stop codon variant that we can annotate quite easily. And, and it can be quite complex. And here um, there is pretty decent data that RNA sequencing can help. And the basic problem is here is such that to be able to really do genetic diagnosis in a, in a rare disease um, situation, we basically need to have two things. If we think about the, the sort of the the situation that works quite easily nowadays is that you can identify just based on the good old genetic code, what is the gene disrupting variant in the coding region. And then you can also kind of put that in the spectrum of population uh, variation in that gene. Uh, Tom referred to many times to the kind of that we need to understand the normal to be able to understand disease. And that is absolutely uh, what is the basis of these rare disease studies. 
Um, but when it, and, and that would then help you to say that, okay, this patient having this kind of a variant, that is an outlier in the population likely, or, or at least potentially contributes to disease. But when it comes to variants that affect gene expression or other traits of, of related to gene regulation, first of all, it's difficult to identify those variants. And it's also difficult to sort of really have a sophisticated framework for, for kind of like, what is the spectrum of normal variation in terms of, let's say, gene expression. And here splicing analysis has been one of the early cases of, of success where um, in RNA sequencing data, it can be quite clear um, um, or, or relatively straightforward to, to see that there is actually an aberrant splicing pattern in a patient that is absent in, in a number of controls. And this may help to identify, for example, uh, intronic variants that, that would be quite, quite sort of obscure just based on genetic data alone. We, us and, us and others have also pushed this uh, further in, in terms of identifying variants that may affect uh, gene expression levels uh, in, in such a way that we used healthy population RNA sequencing data from GTEx and allele specific expression analysis to really sort of for every gene to draw those spectrums of, of how much these genes expression varies in the normal population for genetic reasons. And then one can go to a patient and actually put the patient in the spectrum of, of that normal, normal population distribution and identify uh, outliers. And we've shown that this, this, this can really have a high specificity and sensitivity in, in uh, muscle dystrophy and myopathy patients. And now we're working on applications in congenital heart disease and ALS um, as well. And this framework together with, with others uh, have been incorporated into analysis that really try to use many different types of transcriptome readouts to better interpret rare variants. Um, we were part of um, uh, analysis using, using the most recent uh, GTEx data set, looking at a healthy population cohort RNA sequencing and genotype uh, uh, whole genome sequencing data from multiple tissues, looking at at different types of effects that rare genetic variants can have on transcriptome uh, traits. And in a very interesting preprint that just came out, I think a week ago, it was shown that um, um, transcriptome data can give you a 16% boost in your diagnosis rate over whole genome sequencing, um, detecting many different types of, of perturbations. And I think that these, these examples and these insights are, are proving that transcriptome data is already useful in, in clinical genomics. And, and this, this bold prediction is, is already becoming true in that space. However, in complex disease prediction, um, unsurprisingly, the situation is more complex. So um, thinking we think about sort of um, disease or, or phenotype prediction in complex disease, of course, the, the, um, uh, the main method that is now being, being used or, or studied is, is polygenic scores, which have a lot of promise, but there is still a lot of question marks in terms of their clinical use. Do, do they work? When do they work? When is it good enough to be actually medically meaningful? And one very major problems is, is problem is, is various biases that this is, this course can have in terms of their their sort of transferability, for example, across ancestries and then also other other groups. And there has been some exciting uh, new new research showing that some of these biases can potentially be overcome by by um, overlaying genetic associations with regulatory elements, thus getting better, better um, kind of insight into the causal variance and avoiding some of the um, biases caused by linkage disequilibrium. And I think that there is, there is a lot of potential there. And I think uh, that going forward, the idea that incorporation of tissue and cell type specific functional information into polygenic scores could potentially help to partition complex, complex disease risk to dis distinct components. When we think about most complex traits, if you take, let's say, type 2 diabetes, that can be caused by, by kind of dysregulation or misfunction of many different organ systems and being able to sort of partition different individuals' disease risk in terms of like you have a problem with your lipid metabolism, you have a problem with your insulin metabolism, et cetera, could have a lot of, lot of potential. But we're not exactly there yet, but uh, let's see, maybe by, by 2030, I'm, I'm sure. There is also a very exciting um, area, at least in, in my, my opinion, in, in terms of using um, these molecular phenotypes to incorporate genetic and environmental risk. 
As I mentioned a few slides ago, um, heritability of complex traits is far from 100%. There are major environmental effects in complex disease. And if we are actually able to incorporate those um, risk factors into the same framework as genetic factors, this can be very powerful. I mean, the, the whole um, sort of idea of using, using genetic data to develop drug targets is based on the same paradigm that genetic and environmental risk factors are partially mediated by the same molecular pathways. And, and, this, and, and here, transcript, uh, transcriptional and epigenomic reads, uh, readouts can really help because they should or could uh, capture both types of effects, unlike genetic data alone. And this could be one of those things that actually makes this, this prediction that we're talking about a reality. Um, there are some interesting early, early studies that, that have some promise in terms of showing that RNA sequencing data can inform in an upcoming flare in rheumatoid arthritis, actually driven by a specific cell type. Um, and, and also looking at case control differential expression in, in GWAS genes, where a large part of the, like the, the differential expression that, that is seen is it's much too big to be driven by the genetic variants. There are some other factors as well that, that try this. So, so there, are, there are attempts, there are interesting sort of frameworks that are being developed, but much more data is needed. But I think that there is also major potential in terms of leveraging the, the ability that genetic data has in, in pinpointing causal uh, disease mechanisms. And then thinking about an environmental component that is a modifiable component of, of disease risk and thus be able to potentially develop better in, um, interventions. And Tom talked about this at length, so I'm not going to go super deep into this, but, but I think it's, it should be clear to all of us that, that to understand disease, we really need data of what is the normal. And these kinds of resources that, that um, the, the genetics and genomics community has, has been building have enabled a vast amount of the studies that we now often kind of take for, for granted. There would be no GWAS without HapMap and no whole genome sequencing studies without 1,000 genomes and exact empowering rare, dis rare disease studies, ENCODE, GTX, Human Cell Atlas, et cetera, um, really building that foundational understanding of the regulatory genome. And there are much, there is much, much work that needs to be done uh, in this space to, to just create more sophisticated data of various types of molecular functions that, that vary in human populations and, 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 and thus empower specific disease communities to use this data to explore specific questions. However, there are some major, major issues that we really have to address as a community if we want to use these, these resources to their maximum ability. One of them is that population diversity captured by these resources is very limited at the moment. So, so there are like say thousand genomes of naturally explored uh, global populations, uh, kind of like a couple of hands, handfuls of them. GTX has some, has uh, captures kind of like the average American diversity, but, but we are far from being able to really, really understand um, or like characterize population diversity in, in functional genomics data. And, and as uh, the GWAS and genetics community is now uh, very fast building bigger and bigger resources in, in, in terms of genetic variation across the globe and, and its contribution to diseases, we need to make sure that those functional genomics data, set, data sets are also there to help to uh, interpret and analyze these, uh, these data sets. And a related question is that um, data availability, data dissemination, integration, visualization. It's a serious and difficult problem for functional genomics data because these are kind of messy and hazy data sets in a, in a way that, that terminal and genetic variation is not uh, with major sort of batch effects and other integration issues. But, but unless we are actually able to bring these data sets together and disseminate those into the community and, and make them sort of uh, available across across different, different consortia, we are really sort of shooting ourselves in the, in the foot and not, be, and not being able to leverage the power of these, these resources. So this is also a major area where, where we must uh, invest as a, as a community. Um, but also another area that, that Tom also referred to is that we just simply need more data. We need to scale up the sample sizes in terms of multi-omic uh, data sets, especially in the complex disease 
trade space, but I'm thinking more sort of like normal populations, basically whatever. Uh, if we have learned anything from, from the history of human genetics over the past, let's say 25 years is that uh, in the early days of Chiwas, et cetera, um, the discovery is a little bit so-and-so, a lot of struggles. But when the sample size became sufficient where there was actually good statistical power, amazing di discoveries started to emerge. And when we think about molecular uh, data sets at a population scale, um, studies like GTEx, et cetera, while they are big, they are far from, from those kinds of samples of tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of individuals to really make well, very well powered uh, inference. And there are some, some attempts to fix this. Uh, TopMed is producing a lot of, a lot of um, RNA sequencing data, mostly from flat samples. Uh, in my lab, we have been working on this and this is an interesting project whether that we're now wrapping up, where we have tested four types of non-invasive uh, samples to do uh, RNA sequencing using sort of a low-cost SmartSig2 uh, prep, uh, prep protocol that, is, that, is, that was initially kind of developed or, or is much used in single cell space. And, and here uh, we've collected uh, hair follicles, saliva, buckle swabs, and urine from, from a number of donors and, and then done RNA sequencing on these. And the exciting thing is that compared to just sort of standard hex cells, top-notch uh, RNA uh, from, from um, cell line, we can actually get almost comparable data from hair follicles and from urine, despite the very small numbers of cells and, and especially in urine, the starting material is low, but with these uh, modern library prep uh, methods, we can actually get excellent quality RNA sequencing data from these samples that capture cell types that, that these blood samples that are typically collected cannot capture. And we, can, we have shown that the hair follicle of uh, cell types and that the data is, is very closely related to skin and in, in urine and, uh, and buccal swabs, we get sort of mucosal uh, uh, tissues that, that make sense. There's also some kidney signal in urine. And I think that there's a lot of potential in these types of sample types, but also uh, obvious technical challenges. Buccal swabs sometimes work great, sometimes not. Saliva is absolutely terrible. This is our kind of test uh, example of that, that this is, this is not always, always something that works, works easily. Do not try uh, saliva RNA-seq at home. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges thinking even further ahead is that if eventually we may need to push these types of data sets to single cell resolution and actually think about how to do single cell RNA sequencing in thousands and thousands of samples from, from uh, disease or trait relevant some informative uh, biospecimens. Um, these types of non-invasive kind of swab and poke type of samples that we have been taking, taking thus far is not going to give us sort of brain molecular phenotypes, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is an area where we clearly need to invest yes, uh, as a community. But uh, just to kind of switch gears a little bit for the last couple of slides, I want to basically make the point that prediction is really not enough. Even if we have the perfect black box to predict variant to phenotype, we would still want to understand those mechanisms. Um, I think I have made a relatively compelling uh, um, argument that, that this kind of black box prediction of variant to phenotype is just simply not going to work, especially in complex disease. It's just, <laughs> yeah, we will not be able to build that box. Uh, and also we are scientists. We should be interested in, in mechanisms and wanting to uh, understand how and why certain genetic variants uh, somehow affects molecular and cellular functions in a way that contributes to disease phenotypes. And then if we want to actually develop interventions, drugs and, and other types of interventions to, to do something about this, then we need to understand those mechanisms. And luckily we have a very rich data set to pursue different layers of, of mechanistic questions in terms of what are the causal variants, how do they affect let's say transcription factor binding, enhancer effects, what are the target genes in cis, what are the target genes and pathways and uh, networks in trans, what are the relevant cellular types and states, and then even further to, towards sort of physiological phenotypes and cellular functions. Um, and, and I think that there is, it's just going to be an extremely exciting time for us, us using these different types of approaches using 
uh, these kinds of large scale multi-omic data sets uh, that we have been building, uh, continuing on that, but then also incorporating that with experimental perturbations of the genome and its function with, with uh, tools like, like CRISPR. And I, and I really strongly believe that no approach is going to be a silver bullet. All of these approaches have their unique advantages and disadvantages, and it's only, only with integrated approaches that we can really build a good understanding of, of genome function. And I want to mention you um, a quick example of this type of work. Um, this is from a very recent preprint uh, from, from a collaboration with uh, Neville St. Jana's lab led by our, our postdoc John Morris, where we basically took a plot trait. She was integrated that with ENCODE, et cetera, data of, of potential regulatory elements, fine mapping, and then did CRISPR-I um, inhibition of, of um, those putative regulatory elements, and then did single cell RNA sequencing to see um, which genes are affected by, by uh, silencing of these, these uh, uh, genetic elements where uh, uh, poten potentially causal uh, GWAS variant is sitting. And in terms of um, identifying the cis target genes in, in these loci, we were actually, or I, I was personally surprised by how well this worked. For 42% of the loci or the, or the variants that we tested, we actually discovered the, a significant gene in, in, in cis. And the vast majority of these, these loci lacked an EQTL signal showing that we're really discovering something that is complementary to the data that we have had before. And a particularly exciting example for us was to, was to see that in addition to just capturing those, those uh, target genes in cis, which has been a major challenge for GWAS, we can also get to the more complex question of uh, affected pathways. And uh, for this um, very interesting locus um, uh, where we have a, a GFI1B transcription factor, we actually had two GWAS loci, one in an intronic and one in a, in a downstream um, uh, enhancer that both affected uh, the expression of GFI1B in cis. And then they both also had a major effect on gene expression across the genome with uh, the stronger enhancer having uh, hundreds of significant gene targets um, across the genome. And those target genes were actually organized in a network that, that had sort of three, three specific clusters that seemed to um, represent different uh, sort of fu functional, functional components, with one of the clusters representing more the, the di direct targets of, of this transcription factor, and then another cluster, the cluster C here, um, seems to be, um, um, has really has something to do with heme biosynthesis, uh, which is consistent with, with this transcription factor having a major role in, in, in blood, blood traits and, and are studying uh, specifically uh, blood, blood trait uh, GWAS. And an exciting thing was that, that we had um, very specific uh, enrichment of, of GWAS hits, so independent GWAS hits across the genome in the target genes of this GFI1B um, uh, GWAS locus. And this is suggesting that there may be this kind of like convergence of independent GWAS effects for the same traits in specific uh, cellular uh, pathways that may then be particularly interesting in terms of the, the, the cellular biology behind, behind the traits that are being uh, studied. So to wrap up, what does the future look like? I believe that with these kinds of approaches uh, and addressing the challenges that, that uh, both myself and Tom have talked about, I think, think, I think that we can really incorporate molecular traits uh, as a part of uh, precision medicine and, and improve our, our understanding and, and also treatment of, of personalized disease risk that is driven by genetic and environmental factors. We will be uh, developing deep insights into molecular and cellular etiology of human traits using both these sort of observational population studies and also uh, perturbation studies and experimental uh, tools. And, and all of this requires that we really build a sophisticated toolkit for highly informative in silico inference so that we can have as accurate sort of priors and predictions um, as, as possible in terms of observing a variant of interest or you have a Chiwa study and then your Chiwa's loci and being able to sort of have good um, sort of predictions of what could be the functional um, mechanisms that are, that are being perturbed or the functional effects of these variants. And then also to have a sophisticated toolkit for experimental follow-up of, of these uh, discoveries. 
And with that, uh, my sort of um, the small additions to the prediction would be that that uh, in addition to using the features of epigenetic and landscape and transcriptional output to understand or to predict uh, genetic effects on phenotype, I would also want to understand genetic and environmental effects on, on phenotype and thus build a holistic understanding of, of the diversity of human traits and the underlying genetic and molecular processes. And one of the um, um, sort of venues or places or organizations trying to do this is the International Common Disease Alliance that was launched uh, somewhat, somewhat recently where um, us, especially in the mechanisms working group are really asking the same types of questions that, that we have been talking about uh, today. And with that, I'd like to um, thank many people in, in my lab, our current and former members, um, uh, uh, my collaborators in various consortium projects, uh, um, other collaborators and, and uh, ICDA colleagues and, and sources of funding. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tuli. And um, yeah, both of your presentations are you know, very impressive. And um, as uh, Tom mentioned, this is um, my impression is it's quite challenging to fulfill this bold prediction and um, even daunting. And it seems like it requires multi-discipline approach rather than just to, you know, to, to, to you know, sequence the genome. It's just one kind of one dimensional, just a DNA sequence. But here you're talking about so many different levels. And um, so my quick question will be, you know, do we need a, a new technology, new approach that's, you know, several orders of magnitude faster and more comprehensive because for each person, you cannot just do one sequencing. You have so many different tissues and uh, so many cell types and so many level of um, sequencing you do and um, by sulfate sequencing, you know, uh, whatever. So a lot, a lot of levels. So, so I'm just wondering, you know, using the current technology, can we get it down, you know, in in 10 years or even you know 50 years well if i if i start i think that in terms of sort of um assays to analyze molecular phenotypes whether it's the transcriptome or or epigenomic epigenomic features there is obviously going to be um advances let's say long read rna sequencing a direct rna sequencing is going to be very important but I don't really see those as the major bottleneck. I think something that would really change the game is if we actually had good, cheap, fast, practically feasible ways to differentiate cells uh, um, and basically take cell samples from an individual and obtain other cell types from that. Because those like brain biopsies, they're just really not gonna ever be a, <laughs> a popular thing to do. And for several different diseases and phenotypes, we just don't really have accessible cell types to analyze. I, I, would, I would add to that, which I think is really quite uh, correct. I would add to that two things though. One is I think we're moving in this direction th with the understanding that, you know, an, a, a human or an animal is quite a complicated machine. And uh, it's, it's more than the sum of its parts. And therefore, I think um, there is going to be a sort of effort to do two things. One is to get as much information in situ, in the organism itself, as much as we can, because that's where the interactions with other cell types, that's where the effect of environment, that's where, that's where it's seen. And in addition to that, I think we're moving in that direction because we, the, with the development of organoid systems where cells are placed into an environment with different other types of cells and allowed to re, architecturally reform structures that they normally do in vivo, we begin, just begin to uh, approach a situation where the complexity of an organism begins to reveal itself. And so again, looking at these different methods, sequencing, RNA, methylation determination, um, uh, uh, you know, protein analysis, as much to be done in C2 as possible, 
and do it in a situation where it is as naturally interactive as possible. I think that's where our largest uh, you know, progressions are going to be made. Thank you. Uh, another you know, question I have you know, is about the um, so-called normal. You know, I'm quite impressed by you know, both of you mentioned that it's, um, that it's a key component. You know, if we move forward, if you cannot define normal, then how do you correlate, you know, um, disease states? And um, but the, here the normal is probably a, a very large range. You know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, physiological terms. You know, blood pressure, for example. You know, uh, you know, cell count, blood cell count, and all of this will be a, a range. And also, again. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, different uh, populations and there will be variations. And um, so um, it will not be a single normal, or maybe not a hundred, maybe not a thousand. So again, <laughs> um, so we have to consider all the, these factors, right? I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, the, the normal isn't, it, it, it isn't as if it, you fall off a cliff. At, at this point, right? E even if you're dealing with a spectrum of values, you know, it, it isn't as if, you know, uh, you know as, in, as in the case of blood pressure or something, once you get above this number, you, you're not normal anymore. Because we get these differences in physiology depending on what's going on, you know, with the, with the organism itself. So I, I, I do believe that's right, but I also think that normal, normal uh, behavior or normal uh, activity of genes and modifications so, uh, has to go back to this idea of interactions. The interaction of, of the context in which the, uh, the sample is that's being uh, evaluated is, is going to be everything because it is, that's, that's where, that's why you have this uh, range because the cell or the organ or the tissue is responding to the conditions it can sense. So I, 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 I again, I think the complexity is, uh, is even somewhat more daunting by the fact that doing these experiments on uh, individual cells or a, a collection of cells in a tissue or an even more heterogeneous collection in an organ, all right, that is, that that's going to be, I think, somewhat more uh, problematic because we're going to have to rethink all that data or reconsider it when we have systems that are more lifelike in, in that situation. Yeah, I and mean, I would add, I, I agree with, with all of that. I would add that when it comes to the sort of um, de definition of the normal or when it relates to different populations and different environments and all the sort of human diversity, um, that is, it is certainly important to, to characterize and understand that, that diversity and, and sort of like that we don't think that some sort of, I don't know, <laughs> very specific population somehow represents all of humanity. However, it is also, it also happens quite easily that people really kind of focus on the differences and not on the similarities. And when it comes to sort of like molecular function of human cells or human physiology, a lot of it is shared across all humans, and 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 there is just a lot of a lot of shared components that we also kind of must must keep in mind to kind of like not over overemphasize those those differences that we still should should learn and appreciate. Yeah, in terms of accessing you know large databases, you know, been thought about you know um, collaborating with uh, all of us, and for example, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting, there's an interesting um, RFA out uh, looking at diet, uh, you know, in that, in that population, thousands of people or tens of thousands of people are going to be, you know, uh, they have volunteered to be part of this uh, diet study to see what a precision diet looks like for an individual. And uh, those studies, I, I think are, uh, somewhat, I wouldn't call it the wave of the future, but they are realistically trying to deal with the numbers that are significant, are statistically significant, and the variation of individuals in the population. I think that is, 
you know, I think that is um, really a step forward. Thank you. Um, I think there are quite a number of questions, so we should give um, them a chance. And uh, if I have time in the end, I can ask you additional questions. So Chris, would you please, um, you know, uh, read the questions or? Yes, definitely. So uh, a lot of appreciation for your talk. So thank you again to Tom and Tuli for talking to us today. So you got a number of questions about what normal is. So we're going to come back to that, even though you've addressed some of them. But I want to start actually with one of our most recent questions, which is how do you think that clinical researchers can specifically contribute to achieving this bold prediction? Well, I think obviously the sort of um, the first first thing that comes to comes to mind for for a biologist is by giving us samples, <laughs> but, but obviously it is a much more much more nice and, and, and complex question than than that. Although the sample access question is important, and that is something where we absolutely must work together. I'm I don't have an MD. I have no access to actually go and poke at living individuals. Well, well except for our non-invasive uh, study because it's 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 not invasive. We were actually able to collect those samples without without medical involvement, with the blessing of an IRP. But um, but I think that when it comes to especially the sort of moving more towards the precision medicine space that is thinking about implementations and and the kind of effect sizes that are not just p values, but where you are actually talking about biological and medical importance and let's say PRS, whether some sort of difference in the risk at which point does it become medically meaningful? I think that there needs to be very, very serious dialogue between sort of basic researchers, genomicists, biologists, and, and, and medical uh, pr pr practitioners. Yeah, I, I, I could, I would like to add to that, that uh, I've had an, a really remarkably lucky a set of interactions with many clinicians. And the thing that has really affected me the most is the amount of sort of um, data, not data, but behaviors that they use in their clinical diagnosis. Things that use seemingly are not important in, in terms of when we talk about molecular biology, but makes sense once we understand the molecular biology of what's going on in a particular condition. So it's the, the ability that people who are ill uh, uh, with this particular disease, for example, or become hard of hearing, you know, and, the, and a, a symptom like that, which may not make any sense, you know, to a molecular body. I'm interested in cancer. Why is that, you know, uh, important? Then somehow these, these kinds of, of clinical observations, which are usually uh, acquired in the in the course of rounds, in the course of dealing with patients, and also passed down from one generation of doctors to another. These inf pieces of information are invaluable in some ways because they explain, they, they, they offer the opportunity to form a model of what that, uh, what that phenotype is compared to the molecular uh, processes that are going on. I, I, I think that is how, one way in which uh, uh, you know the interaction between clinicians and uh, and people who who work at the bench. You know uh, has has been and, and could continue to be very valuable. And that's an area where patient groups contribute as well, right? By defining, Absolutely. helping you determine the symptoms and everything. Yeah, I think those are great answers. So getting back to the question of normal, I think a lot of the questions that you're getting are um, a little bit along the lines of what Tuli said earlier, that people focus a lot on the differences and, and, and they're asking questions about that. But we did have Mallory who asked, what can and what, what, what can slash must we do as a community? to ensure that data are collected uh, to make sure that we have multiple axes of diversity. So how can we do better to be more inclusive of individuals? Since you're both involved in big projects, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I, you know, again, it's, it is one of those situations where <clears throat> it, the limitations is often based on access. The, um, the ability to recruit if you're part of a large a project, the ability to recruit is it basically dis, it defines what kinds of diversity you can, uh, you know, bring into that uh, situation. 
that's why I, I think the example of the all of us situation is very valuable because it mm -hmm. starts with the premise of ha needing to have very large populations. All right. And, and in doing so, when you start with that premise, I think uh, it, it offers the opportunity to be able to say, all right, we're not limited by n number of people. That's not the concern, all right? The question is, if we need 100,000 people, how do we afford that? How do we organize that? How do we, you know, control, uh, you know, have the right controls and kinds of things? So that, that becomes the more relevant question at the end, because you start with the premise of needing to have as large a diverse group as possible. Yeah, and I could, I could add to that in terms of uh, also thinking about a, a global perspective and, and, and like building these big projects. One of the things that, that ICDA is working on is sort of um, at least somewhat unified consent and recruitment and biospecimen collection and other types of protocols to make it easier for investigators in different countries to collect data that is then interoperable and intercreatable um, to be able to actually use this data for, for in, in bigger and bigger studies. And I think that in addition to, to sort of, uh, let's say doing better outreach and incentivizing minority populations, let's say in the US to participate in medical research, uh, we also need to sort of make the barriers lower for investigators in developing countries to be able to engage in this, these kinds of studies, whether it is sort of resources, uh, protocols, access to sort of, let's say the inner circles of, of where science happens. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you that those are such important points there. So uh, another question about normal, we got two related questions. So I'm gonna put them together. Um, the first one was Laura, who's asking, what is the relevance of age in defining a normal phenotype? Should age be stratified to control for expression that might occur over lifespan? And then Mark also asked for Tom and your talk, you use normal in particular because because brains at advanced ages rarely are truly free of pathology. Should we really be thinking of normalness as a dichotomy and more of a qualitative trait? So can you specifically address age? And then it sounds like also with some focus on the brain. Well, I guess I could say a couple of things about age since we've been studying it quite, quite recently from in one of the top med cohorts in the MESA cohort where we actually have longitudinal samples that are 10 years apart. And we've been looking at sort of age interacting regulatory variants and, and sort of how does gene expression methylation change with age. And it's complicated. And, and it's also probably one of those areas where we, where it's not going to be enough to just have molecular phenotypes from a complex tissue sample, in this case, blood, blood cells, because cell type composition varies between age. It also varies between phenotypes and sexes, et cetera. And that explains a major component of the, of the differences. And I think that this is one of those areas where, where the cell type, in, insights into cell type composition will be really crucial to actually understand what is, what is going on. And even the most sophisticated molecular assays reading those molecular phenotypes are going to easily lead you astray unless you understand the cell type context. I, I, you know, the, I think the question is a, is a good one. It, it, in the case of age, you know, we're all living old, uh, much more uh, pro, in a prolonged life. Um, we, you know, we, we have to think about this as, as um, I think it was Mark you said, uh, as, a, as a quantitative continuum. There, we, where our comparisons are within a stratified group. And what and it goes back to the question of in that stratified group, what is normal? What is operatively normal? It may not be normal in any other strat stratification, but in that group, it's normal. And maybe the functionality of that group is not the same as others. You don't remember as well, or you don't, um, you, you, you're not as rapid thinker or thinks whatever as you get older. But in that group, in that stratified group, that's normal. That's not different. And therefore, as was suggested, there is a continuum, all right? And it very much is dependent on age. And it's also dependent on the phenotype, the manifestation uh, in, uh, of wh whatever uh, phenotype that we're talking about. 
So I, I think that is um, important to understand. And, uh, and, I, I, and I think uh, in, in, in terms of what uh, Tuli said earlier, it, that it's the similarities that also will mark how, uh, 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 how much deviation is going on within a stratification. So if in that stratification, <clears throat> there are X number of, phenot of, of, uh, of biochemical and molecular processes that are being monitored, and most of them are similar and others are not, then we know where to look to see if that is constitution, uh, that constitutes not being non-normal because we now have a place to look at a larger population. So I, I would say that's probably. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So again, we have two questions which are related to each other. Um, they're both about identical twins. So the first one is what's the level of correlation of gene expression in identical twins versus unrelated individuals? And the second is uh, could order of exposure to environmental factors in, in uh, identical twins affect their phenotype? I have I'm, I'm reminded of these, this paper, uh, these papers that we were about, they must be about 15 years old now or so. When the, when the, the Spanish groups were studying uh, identical twins. And, um, and it, it was remarkable because it was very clear that young, uh, young individuals, identical twins, um, had very similar uh, 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 DNA modification and expression profiles at, at, a, at a very young age. But as they got older, and particularly if they were separated, all right, then that, that uh, similarity uh, broke down quite considerably. Uh, if they were, and it, in some ways, it was seemed to be related to the fact that uh, different behavioral environments, different habits and behaviors, are right, have their obvious effects on the physiology and and uh, the genomics of of the individuals. And so, uh, in large measure, if the individuals are are uh, in the same environment and and um, and uh, have very similar kinds of exposures to things that are risk uh, prevailing, then they will have very similar kinds of reactions because basically the groundwork has been set up for the reactions to have to happen. If they uh, if they see a different set of environments, and that's not only the external environments but internal environments, the foods they eat, the, uh, the, uh, the cleanliness of the areas, and so the, the infections they acquire and so forth. All of that will lead to variation even among uh, um, identical twins. So I, I think it, in large measure, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a system that was used very much to emphasize the importance of environmental change on the overall be, uh, molecular behavior of the of the individual. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add to that. What was the second question, Chris? It's a, the first one was about how much correlation actually is there in twins versus unrelated individuals, and the second one was could you conceive that? Um, and I think Tom addressed this that the yeah. order of environmental exposures would affect their phenotype. Yeah, no, I which agree. It sounds like the but, but again, here I want to emphasize the the importance of cell type composition. So if you take blood samples from one twin and, and the other, and the other one had a cold a couple of weeks ago, there is going to be differences in cell type, cell type proportions that will manifest as differences in gene expression levels. And we know from, from for example, from GTEx that like the major component, the major source of gene expression variation is cell differences in cell type composition. So if you had a very specific cell type extracted from both twins, I think that those numbers would go even up from what we know from most studies. Thus for. So specificity would be the answer, although you'd want to have some information about what percentage of cell type that was at the time. Yeah, to be able to answer that. So uh, maybe one more question before I turn it back over to Paul, which is this one's from Dina. Closing the genotype phenotype gap requires integration of functional data to recapitulate, to recapitulate real life disease pathology. How can we feasibly achieve this, especially for complex diseases? Ending with an easy question there. Go ahead, Tully. Complex disease. 
Well, like what, what was the table that I had with these kinds of like five times six and I only got to the cellular level there and didn't even sort of address the sort of like, like cellular function, like, like insulin excretion and physiological phenotypes. So yeah, no, I think they, we just need to do a ton of work and using all kinds of approaches that will be complementary and, and also including some of the future future kind of approaches that, that we've discussed um, uh, today. I don't like we don't we don't have like the pipeline, the toolkit, the method sort of build that will get there. And I think that we're also very much sort of like there is a there is a bunch of approaches, but kind of what is exactly the best in different types of settings is not entirely clear. This is also something that, that ICDA is, is sort of working on taking a bunch of sort of kind of like flagship diseases, like example diseases and trying to take those apart. And then if we can actually use that to, do, to develop generalizable lessons on how to do this across very diverse set of traits and diseases. And I think that, as I said, I think this will include both the sort of observational population type of studies where you collect cells from, from actual individuals and also <coughs> in vitro studies with different types of model systems. Yeah, thank you. And Paul, I'll turn it back to you unless Tom wants to add some of that. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, we have, so just maybe a final question or comment, you know, Again, we we'll talk about the um, uh, differences versus uh, you know commonality among populations, you know diversity and things like that. I, I think you know um, my question will be for this bold prediction: Do we, you know, so it seems to be a dichotomy or some kind of a tension between the two? And uh, on one side, I agree. You know, for big data, look for population trend and the normal range, all that stuff. So you want to look at what's in common and uh, how do you define uh, disease stage versus you know a normal stage. But but for when you apply this to precision medicine, for example, then you really want to look at each patient as a unique person, you know, unique set of um, genotype, unique set of environmental factors. And um, but how you efficiently doing this on each patient, especially with so much data. And how do you apply to individual uh, from a clinician point of view? Uh, Paul, I need a little help on this. So is the question that the data types are large and diverse? How does a clinician? Uh, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you, you know, have efficient data collection from each patient? And, uh, and also how you apply the knowledge a population point of view to a single patient. Yes, yes, right. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, I think, you know, clinicians have a lot to teach us in this because I, they do start with the supposition that each individual is unique, all right? And that, that what they learned in medical school could be, could be contradicted by this individual, you know, in some, some, some very tangible way. Um, I think that's that approach is probably a lesson that you know molecular biology should should uh, pay attention to. That is to say, we we you know we tend to treat things in a, in a much more um, uh, you know in, in a much more commun communal sense because we're looking for bottom line answers or bottom line uh, uh, explanations, all right. And when we when we go back and look at the individual, the you know things that we would look for to explain a particular clinical state or whatever, you know, would start with these uh, uh, this sort of a, a general bottom line uh, summaries, right? But then I think when when those are, those are usually uh, you know the first things that look for. But then what what molecular biology can offer is variations that you are seem to be un, in terms of frequency seen and where they are occurring in the genome offer alternatives to be added to the bottom to, to these bottom line uh, summaries and i think that that's sort of a that's sort of an approach which i think uh, requires uh, you know a, a, a 
a, a path, a, a, a process by which we, we as molecular biologists can uh, interact in a way which provides information about the, uh, uh, the behavior, the phenotype genotype relationships that we uh, uh, happen in addition to the ones that have been well characterized. And I think that kind of information is probably the one way in which to, uh, in, in, you know, translate or synthesize information, which is very complex and very, very numerous. Thank you very much, uh, both for your wonderful presentation and insightful comments and discussions. And uh, I'd like to thank the audience and uh, thank you, Chris, for the, you know, uh, you know, uh, design this whole process and uh, the seminar series and uh, Susan for the support and, you know, admin support and Gerald, William and Alvaro for IT support. And thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye.